It's Sunday, October 15, 2023. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is the author of 10 books, most recently Trumpocracy and Trumpocalypse. In 2001, 2002, he was a speechwriter for President George W. Bush. These days, he's staff writer at The Atlantic. David Fromm, welcome back to The Weekend Thank Show. Thank you so much. So uh, it's been a while since we last spoke, and it's as if American history moves at such a pace these days. So we have a lot to talk about. Obviously, I want to talk about uh, Israel and uh, the war with Hamas. But first, let's have a quick look at the election race here in the, U in the U.S. Uh, you wrote a piece in August entitled The First Great Crisis of a Second Trump Term, you said if re-elected, the former president would move to make his legal troubles disappear, constitutional chaos and political mayhem would ensue. Tell us about how those thoughts of yours since August might have evolved in, in the last month or two. Well, we are about 13 months away from the vote. Um, and then, of course, the inauguration of the next president or the second term of the current president in January. Um, that's enough time for the criminal processes against Donald Trump to advance pretty far. Um, so it's quite likely that by voting day, uh, Trump will be either already convicted of a federal criminal offense or a state criminal offense, or he may be on the verge of doing so. So his highest priority, should he return to the presidency, uh, would be to find some way to shut down uh, his legal troubles or es escape them if the legal troubles have already closed on him. So that would mean shutting down um, federal investigations. That would mean finding some argument to persuade a state court to let him go. That would mean conceivably pardoning himself or trying to. So my argument in the article is that none of these none of these things can work within the American constitutional system, that any one of them leads to an immediate crisis. And let, let me talk about the simplest example, and that's um, the self-pardon. Uh, if a president comes to office convicted of a crime, can the president pardon himself? And many people will argue that he can. At least he can pardon himself for federal crimes. And, and I would say, well, if that's true, then the president can shoot the first lady in the White House and pardon himself for the murder. Now, Congress might still impeach him and remove him from office, but the first lady would be dead and he would be scot-free. If, if this theory were true, the vice president could shoot the president immediately become president, immediately write himself a pardon for the crime and become, and become president. And again, Congress might impeach him and remove him, but he'd at least have impunity for the murder of the president. So none of that can be right. None of that can be right. So the president can't have a pardon power of self-pardon, but we're going to spend a good deal of time arguing about that. And it won't just be an argument because uh, somewhere along the way, Trump will win a court case or two as president. He has a lot of friendly judges. And that means the debate moves into the streets as people mobilize in the kind of actions you've seen in other countries where the head of government, the head of state, tries to overturn the legal system to his own personal advantage. Could we not argue that we are already in a constitutional crisis? Because to have a, an ex-president who has four indictments, 91 charges, saying horrific things about the judges, about the DAs, his use of language is so abusive. I mean, this is very dangerous for America in the meantime, isn't it? Well, it's it's not good, um, but it's uh, it's not quite crisis level because um, he, he is out of power and he doesn't have ability to create direct legal chaos. He can intimidate, he can bluster, he can threaten, um, but he can't actually do. He doesn't have those mechanisms. But very possibly, in January 2025, he will try to claim those legal mechanisms, and then we're in a crisis. I, I, I mean, you, you, you have kind of traditional conservative values. I, would I be right in saying that? Yeah, I mean, you're certainly anti-Trump, but typically you, you do lean to the right. Yeah. So as a conservative with a small C or however we want to describe it, how can you align with a party that is in such chaos and is refusing to denounce some of the language of Donald Trump. I mean, he is so far ahead in the polls for the primary. He, I mean, it's so weird, isn't it? Because they keep their distance from him, but they need him. So there is this kind of duality to the national conversation. How do you feel as a conservative and how should other conservatives behave at the ballot box considering there, there is so much at stake? 
I just don't, th- those are, uh, you're asking a question that um, doesn't align at all with the way I think about my small role in this big world. Um, so I'm a writer and a journalist. Uh, my job is to say and write what I think and see as best and as honestly as I can. Um, and uh, on some of those questions, I'm going to come up with uh, pretty conservative answers. So I did, a, I've done a lot of work uh in the non uh, in these years where we were spared Trump, especially in the first two, on the problem of, for example, of um, th- there are claims by um, some former colonies to reclaim art from museums in Britain and Germany. So I, I wrote two major articles, and I went to Nigeria to write about why I thought that was not a good idea. Um, you know, I uh, I've been writing a lot about Mexican politics, where I'm very worried by um, the current president, who's often I think falsely or in it unusefully described as left wing, but he's making attacks on the legal system in Mexico, very similar to those of Donald Trump here. And I've written a lot about that. Um, When the subject turns to what do I think about um, uh, the rule of law in the United States, I have my views. I I just, so people will often say to me, um, well, you used to work for President Bush um, and therefore you should think this. I said, I never worked for President Bush. I worked for the United States government, which happened at the time to be headed by George W. Bush. George Bush, W. Bush had asked me to do something that was improper or illegal. Um, I would either have said no if it was, uh, I would I, I would either have uh, said no if it was not in his legal power to make this question, or I would have resigned if it was in his legal power uh, to ask it. I just don't think that way. Um, you know, I, and when, when you listen to me, you're not hearing the voice of conservatism. You're not hearing a spokesman for anything other than my own thoughts and views. But the reason I ask the question is because, you know, U.S. politics is so polarized and people are keen. The media is certainly keen to compartmentalize and go, well, you must be in that camp and you must be in that camp. And I'm the same as you. You know, I have differing and nuanced views. But I want to know how this is going to play out at at the ballot box in November 2024, because are traditional Republicans going to put a cross in the in the Biden box, knowing that hopefully they're not going to tell anybody they've done that, but knowing that democracy is at stake, because this is really the, the issue, isn't it? That, that the very fabric of the institutions, the pillars of US democracy will change if Donald Trump wins. Well, to jump ahead to a topic you're going to, you had intended to ask later in the show, but I'm going to pull it forward here. Um, the election of 2020 is going to be a contest between two big strategies. Um, the uh, 2024, I beg your pardon. The, the yeah. Biden strategy is to do again in 24 what he did in 20, which is pull over just enough uh, um, historically Republican voters um, to pull him to 50, 51 um, percent. If you look at all the elections of the past, since the year 2000, there have been there have been until now six um, and you there have been 12 candidates. You stack them in order of the share of the vote. Biden in uh, 20. Uh, Twenty got the second highest share of the vote of any candidate of the 21st century, except for Barack Obama in 2008. But it wasn't huge. It was like 51 percent. And he did it because he did better among men than Hillary Clinton had done in 2016, and especially had done better among white men than Hillary Clinton had done in 2016. So he pulled over just enough. You don't have to change the minds of millions of people. You have to change the mind of a few hundred thousand people. The Trump strategy, Trump understands, or at least the people around him do, there is no hope to get Donald Trump above 46 percent. So their strategy is to splinter the Democratic coalition by uh, setting in motion a lot of um, uh, vociferous candidacies, Uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, Joe Manchin, um, Cornell West, trying to put out a a lot of sort of chaff in the hope that different parts of the of the Democratic coalition, which is always larger but less stable than the Republican coalition, um, will hive off after these various things. And you can without pushing Trump much above 46%, you can drive down Biden down to look to 48, 47%, and then hope that the Republican advantage in the electoral college does the rest of the job. That's the, that's the game. Biden trying to pick up a few more votes, Trump trying to split Biden's vote. These distractions, such as RFK Jr., and I'm happy to talk about him now, the, the original idea was to split the Dem vote, but it now looks like it's going to split the Republican vote. And, I'm and not in so fact, sure. You, I, I, don't, I don't believe well, that. Well, this is what I'm interested to hear from you. I mean, uh, so, nobody really knows. Um, oh, pick me. Pick me. I know. Um, okay. <laughs> so, so um, look, RFK Jr. Um, is obviously not a completely mentally well person, and he's not obviously a very nice person. Um, uh, 
he is responsible for many, many sick children, people who heeded his advice um, not to vaccinate children against infectious disease because it might cause autism, which is an unbelievably obnoxious thing to say in a couple of ways. First, it exposes children to risk of all kinds of terrible diseases, mutilation and death. And second, it suggests that it's better to be dead than to have an autism, for your child to be dead than to be on the autism spectrum, um, which is just a, a brutal way to think about people. I mean, um, autism is obviously a challenge for people and there are very severe cases where it becomes a disability, but for pe many people have mild autism and, and they have a different way of seeing the world. It's can, it can be valuable that way of seeing the world. And, and anyway, it's better than being dead, uh, which, uh, which is what you get from measles. Okay. So, um, he was mobilized by, um, some people in the, in the Trump world and some rich don Republican donors to try to stand up, a. a challenge inside the Democratic Party to Biden. And the theory was, and it wasn't a very good theory, that there are Democratic voters who are so ignorant and so detached, or maybe so elderly, they, they don't remember that Bobby Kennedy was killed in 1968. And they think here he is back to life uh, in 2024, and they can vote for Bobby Kennedy one more time. So it pretty wrapped, and there was, there was one poll the first week out where it turned out there were some people who were confused or who maybe thought he was carrying on his father's work. So there's this early poll that showed him with like 15% of the Democratic Party vote. So that lasted a week um, because information spreads fast in the modern world. And people realize, no, he's not the Bobby Kennedy I loved back in 1968. He's a completely different person more than half a century later. And I don't love him. So his standing in the Democratic primary just collapsed, at which point he was supposed to get the hint to go away. But, uh, but the problem is a super PAC had been built with money in it. And, and he was enough of an egomaniac that he didn't choose to go away. So he's now talking about an independent candidacy. Now, some people say this will hurt by, uh, Trump more than Biden, and they do that with, by blackboard logic. But the key question to ask about Bobby Kennedy is who is in control of the super PAC with the millions of dollars that have been raised that will buy ads, and where will those ads be aimed? So although Bobby Kennedy may be in some ways attractive to the Trump voter with his anti-vaccine message, his anti-democracy in Ukraine message, and his just general boorishness and bad behavior, um, the people who control the money, who are separate, it's a super PAC, it's not his campaign, they will be aiming their ads at President Biden. The, the, the siblings, um, Kathleen Kennedy, Townsend, Joseph Kennedy II, Rory Kennedy, Kerry Kennedy, they released a statement that called their brother's choice to run against Biden as a third party candidate dangerous to our country. Um, th this obviously did not please RFK Jr. And it only seeks to um, segregate him further from that kind of family heritage. Do you think that message has kind of got through that the family yeah. don't want anything to do with this guy? Yeah. Um, I, I'm look, I'm not a big Kennedy fan and I'm not so sure that I think their family heritage is all, is all that. Um, but let me put it this way. Every family has a Facebook un uncle. Why should the Kennedys be any different? <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I mean, I, I, I just feel that the, the political discourse is such that what you're describing about fundraising and ads, it's so sad that that's how we get people elected in this country. You know, like who's got the, the biggest wallet? And, and really this issue of rep true representation is so far from anything that the Electoral College can offer. Well, what we've seen is there are, money can do a lot, but it can't do everything. If money did everything, Ron DeSantis would be cruising to the Republican nomination. He raised, I think, altogether, if you add up his state funds and his federal funds and his cam campaign funds and his super PAC funds, together he'd probably raise $200 million, which is vastly more than Donald Trump has or will raise. Um, it didn't work because in the end, the dogs have to like the dog food. Let's go back to uh, Donald Trump's potential successful win in 2024. There's this document called Project 2025 that's been produced by the Heritage Foundation that basically lays out whatever, whichever candidate, Republican yeah. candidate would be successful, how they would operate the, the, the United States government, shutting down the FBI, getting rid of school, uh, kind of, you know, educational establishments and the judiciary. I mean, total overhaul and rebuilding it in Donald Trump's image. Does, does that scare you? I mean, what do you think the chances I, I think are of something like that happening? I think that is an example of how the Washington think tank world has completely deluded itself about what a Trump presidency is going to be like. There's going to be, there's going to be from the first minute, one agenda, maybe two agenda items in a Trump presidency. One, shutting down the courts to protect Donald Trump and all the chaos 
that will result from that. Because the courts, there'll be fights, there'll be protests, it will not be easy. And by the way, it's not clear that Donald Trump carries both houses of Congress. So he may have a second or actually a third impeachment fight on his hands. And then his second project is going to be punishing Ukraine for um, getting him impeached the first time and ha- delivering Ukraine to uh, the Russians with all that ensues from that, more chaos. More, the idea that you're going to have a planned approach to rebuilding the administrative state, I mean, it's farcical. Uh, in, when Donald Trump ran in 2016, um, a Repub- an unnamed Republican consultant, I think I know who it is, but since I'm guessing, I won't use his name, said teaching Donald Trump about policy is like teaching Charles Manson Foxtrot. He may be able to do a step or two, but eventually he'll put a pencil in your eye because he's Charles Manson. And and in the same way that you're not going to get any kind of orderly process from Trump. And this hypothetical next Trump term will be even more of a chaos than the last. And and the, the right thing for every, what I would say to all my friends in the think tank world, and I've often said this, is imagine if Donald Trump had lost in 2016. What would your world look like today? Well, Hillary Clinton would have been president, but we know Cong- House and Senate would have been Republican. That's That happened. So you'd have had President Hillary Clinton fenced in by a Republican House and Senate. In 2018, instead of losing the House, the Republican Party would have gained seats in the House. At that point, in 2020, we'd be looking at a fourth Democratic term. Hillary, President Clinton would almost certainly have lost, plus there's COVID, so definitely lost. So you, uh, Nikki Haley or somebody like that comes into power in 2020 with um, with a Republican House and Senate. Is that the end of the world? Like you don't take shortcuts in politics. You don't do cheat codes. You know, uh, you're, you're better you're better off winning with someone you believe in than slipping into office with someone you know is a goofball. Um, so it, with Trump likely or almost certain to be the nominee in 2024, the right move for the Heritage Foundation and everyone who agrees with them is to say um, lose. Lose. If uh, if Trump is the nominee and if he loses in 24, 2026 is going to be a Republican landslide. And uh, and the, the Republicans will gain House and Senate. In 2028, you'll be able to nominate some non-sociopathic person who will deregulate the economy and lower taxes and do the things you want to do. Just, you know, the whole point to elections is there's always another one unless you do something terrible. So there isn't another one. So there's always another one. Wait for that. In this case, you know, lose the election, hold on to your values, hold on to your principles um, and be ready for 2026 and 2028. That It won't be the end of the world. But Trump doesn't lose, right? He still thinks he won in 2020, effectively. Yeah. Uh, if he had have just lost and accepted that he'd lost, he could have kept his mouth shut for four years, run again and probably won. But he didn't. He said that he had won. He said the election was rigged. He said that the whole thing was a hoax and a witch hunt and all the stuff that's come since. And he has he has unseated that kind of system that people believe in. You know, the vote is not as safe in America as it once was because of his language. If Donald Trump could have done those things, he wouldn't be Donald Trump. <laughs> right. You know, I. Um, uh if he could have done those things in 2020, he could have done different things in 2019 and in 2018 and 2017 and 2016. He, you know, if, if, uh, uh, if Donald Trump had been a completely different human being, his presidency would have been a completely different presidency, but he's not, he's the guy we know and, and have to deal with. And so we have to face, um, the consequences of his particular manias and compulsions, and they're not going to change. They're only going to get worse. But if he, if he runs and loses in 2024, He's going to do what he did in 2020 and say it's it was a, a rigged election. It was election interference. And this whole cycle will begin again. I, I don't think so. If he first if he loses in 2024, a couple of things happen. First, he's either in imminent danger or already on the way to spending the rest of his life in prison for uh, his many crimes. Second, um, that he's persuaded a lot of people who know better in the Republican world to look at, away from the actual record. Trump lost the popular vote in 2016. He lost the House in 2018. He lost the presidency in 2020. He com- threw away two Senate seats in 2021 that otherwise were completely winnable for the Republicans, giving Democrats control of the Senate for the first uh, two years of President Biden. And then in 2022, Republicans had another problem in 2022, which is the overturning of Roe versus Wade. But Trump saddled the Republicans with weirdo crackpot candidates and a number of otherwise winnable Senate seats, uh, making sure that um, the Republicans had a terrible year in 2022. You know, Republicans captured the House of Representatives in 2022. So that was the headline that they won barely. Uh, but what people tend to forget is they lost, they had a net loss of one in the Senate. 
They had a net loss of two governorships. And here's the most shocking fact. Of the 99 state chambers, most states have two, Nebraska has one, 99, the Republicans lost four. Now, the out party, the party of the non, that isn't the party of the president, has not had a result like that in the state light races in a non-presidential year since the 1930s. That is a calamitous shock. Now, that was driven more by abortion than um, than by Trump. Two of the four uh, chambers lost were the two chamber were the chambers in Michigan, and where abortion was very salient as an issue. Oh, and they lost control of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, which is a huge defeat because you need that Supreme Court to gerrymander Wisconsin, which would be a uh, which, if it had fair districts, would be a blue state, but has been gerrymandered into a red state. There are going to be different maps in Wisconsin in 2024, and that makes Wisconsin a very difficult state for Republicans, not so much for the presidency, but for everything else down the ballot. Um, so Republicans, if Trump loses in 2024, I think they eventually put two and two together and say, uh, this guy has cost us almost a decade of power. Um, if if uh, Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, the next eight years would have been a Republican-dominated era, uh, as is loss, loss, loss. And that is converted, by the way. Biden turned out to be, and this is a long speech, I'm sorry, Biden turned out to be a much more effective legislative engineer than President Obama was. So he got passed for his party in his first two years much bigger and more left-wing things than Obama got passed in his first two years, even though Obama had much bigger majorities in both houses of Congress. Well, Biden is white. And I guess maybe he's able to do bipartisan deals just based on his race. No, oh, uh, but uh, I let me say, Obama at one point had sixty senators, Biden had fifty. Uh, I I don't think race offsets ten senators. Now, part part of it was the circumstances, part of it was COVID, uh, but part of it was just um, being better at that part of the job. You know, uh, politics is is political, um, and a lot of people. Um, vote because certain ways, because they want things, because they get talked into them, because they get cajoled. Um, you know, uh, you only get so far with a politician saying, look, this may cost you your career, but you'll have the satisfaction of knowing you did the right thing. And there are politicians on whom that line of argument works, but not a lot. Okay. We need to take a quick pause uh, for our sponsor, but uh, I want to come back and talk about Israel and uh, certainly what Donald Trump has said about Benjamin Netanyahu and various other interactions in just a moment on The Weekend Show. We all hate wasting food. Now, nothing is ever wasted thanks to Lomi. I have a Lomi and it's changed the way I think about my food waste. Lomi transforms my trash into treasure at the push of a button. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns food scraps into plant food in four hours. There's no rotting food in my garbage and smelling up the kitchen now. I only take the trash out on garbage day. Plus, no more leaky bags. I turn my waste into nutrient-rich loamy earth that I can feed to my plants, lawn or garden instead of sending it to the landfill. I can help the environment and make my life easier. All my food scraps, plant clippings and even those leftovers I forgot in the back of the fridge can go back into my garden, helping me grow more nutritious food at home. And now Lomi's new app lets me track my environmental impact, earn points for every cycle and redeem freebies from Lomi plus other great brands. I learned that food waste makes up a huge portion of our personal carbon footprint. By reducing the amount of food I send to landfill, I'm helping do my part for the planet. Whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash weekend and use the promo code weekend to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash weekend and use promo code weekend at checkout. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Using silver infused fabrics originally inspired by NASA, Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long so you get a better sleep 
every night. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odours. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than bed sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Bacteria can clog your pores, causing outbreaks and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash weekend to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code weekend at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash weekend and use the code weekend to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. That's trymiracle.com slash weekend to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. It's the weekend show. I'm Anthony Davis. We're back with David Fromm, and we are. I'm keen to look at Israel because there's a lot about the conflict after the attack by Hamas on Gaza that the media doesn't want to say, and there is an allegiance, typically in America, that Israel has to be supported at whatever cost. It was actually the Irish Prime Minister who had the confidence to come out and say that some of the response from Israel, the dropping of 6,000 bombs in, in 24 hours, could constitute a, you know, a war crime. I mean, potentially, this is... This is Mikhail uh, Martin? Uh, no, this was Leo Varadkar. Okay. And so, you know, I'm obviously, I'm somebody who advocates for peace and peace on both sides, but that has not been forthcoming uh, over the last decades. And so, really, maybe this war is something that Netanyahu has been looking forward to to bringing about. What, what Anthony, are your views I, on this? I, I think you want to rewind that. We, we are talking about the single biggest one-day murder of Jewish people since Hitler ran the, the German state. Um, I, I, I don't think you want to talk about this as a stunt or in those political terms. Um, uh, this is an, atro- an, uh, an atrocity on what Hamas did, and it's not just the killings, it's not just the camp. It's the mass use of sexual violence as a weapon of terror. Um, every one of the women they hauled away is going to be sexually abused. Every single one. Um, and many of the women who uh, were on left on the field of murder were sexually abused uh, in horrible ways. Um, and the idea that anybody on the Israeli side, Israel was caught by surprise. This is, Netanyahu has lost his, his career as he should because of this, because the, the um, this is a nightmare. The reason I, I sorry, I've, I've blanked on who was currently head of the Irish state, but I saw Mikhail Martin, who I guess now is, is the opposition leader, uh, give a speech in the Irish parliament in which he said, what is needed here is not an Old Testament approach. What is needed here is a New Testament approach. Now, I think any Jewish person, and I'm Jewish, who listen to that, said, we have been on the receiving end of that New Testament approach for a long time, and there's a little less love and kindness in it than the Christian world may think. And, a little, and, and the idea that you are describing Jews as a uniquely vengeful people is uh, uh, a pretty abhorrent thing to say. And I say this, I like Mikhail Martin as a politician. I've, I've interviewed him. I have a lot of respect for him. But it was, it was an example of how um, the reason there's an Israel is because they're, like, Jews are a very adaptable people. I, as I said, I'm Jew, Jewish. They learn the language of the country. They adapt. They f- fall into his institutions. But there's always a part where you, you catch something. You say, we're pretty alone on this planet. And they're surrounded by a lot of people who do not mean us well. And even if they mean us well, do not really understand us. And even if they understand us, are capable of saying casually, someone as liberal minded and humane as, as him could say something, you know, ca- your religion is vengeful and my religion is full of love. Uh, never mind the Spanish Inquisition. Um, and, uh, and the reason there's a state of Israel, as um, President Biden has said so eloquently, and as the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken has said, is precisely because there are these moments where Jews are alone. And they, um, and that day, October 7th, Jews were alone. And there is a state of Israel, and that's why it exists, is because um, it, the mass murder of Jews did not start with the state of Israel. It unfortunately did not stop with the state of Israel. Um, it is something that Jews have in our DNA. 
um, as something that could happen. Um, and uh, we're all connected. Uh, one of the people abducted is the son of cousins of mine. Um, other people are uh, parents of friends. Um, and my daughter who lived in Israel for a time, she's had friends of hers who have lost their lives on the day and other friends of hers who are very likely to lose their lives in the day ahead as, ahead as they go into combat. So um, it's a terrible thing. I've, there's not a person in the world who wouldn't wish that um, this had been stopped either preemptively before it happened or on the day and that the retaliation that now must ensue, there's no way for it not to ensue. And but which is the retaliation appropriate? That's really the question here is that the, the, it is such a, I mean, more bombs were dropped in a day than throughout the whole kind of Af Afghanistan theater. Yeah, Afghanistan doesn't have concrete structures. Uh, you know, th there is this, uh, there is this idea. I mean, Israel is a more developed society, more technologically advanced society the regime of the Gaza Strip gives it more power. People say, aha, therefore these guys are the good guys. I say, really? Did anyone here seen gone with the wind? Remember the scene where Rhett Butler says to a room of Southern gentlemen, you don't have any cannon factories. You don't have any railways. You don't have any steamships. The North, the South was the underdog in 1861. They were also the slaveholders. They were, they were outgunned, outnumbered, but they were not, that didn't make them right. Uh, that just made them foolish to start a war. They also happened to have a bad cause. And in this case, yeah, Hamas was foolish to start this war. Um, but it has been preparing for it. And for two years, it caught Israel by surprise. And Israel now has to retrieve some dozens, maybe more than 100 hostages. It has to destroy Hamas's war-making power. Um, and uh, because Hamas uses atrocious methods of hi hiding among civilians, I mean, if you put your he headquarters underneath a hospital, is the world supposed to say, okay, well, in that case, your head headquarters is off limits? Or is that you put them on, you put the headquarters under the hospital. That was your decision. What happens to that hospital is on you, not on the people who come after you in order and have to go through the hospital in order to get to you. But it is this issue of, of attacking civilians as opposed to military targets and, and, and military individuals. That is, it is really well, the very well, gray area for no, nobody on both would, sides. We'd all appreciate it if um, Hamas would. Uh, night, neatly segregate military from civilian targets and park the military targets in a desert somewhere so they could be antiseptically dealt with. But they know they would lose that war um, and lose it instantly and, uh, um, and overwhelmingly. So their method, uh, but I, there is no obligation. And I, I think a lot of people invoke the laws of war without ever thinking about what they are. The laws of war does not, do not say the terrorist must win. Uh, the terrorist has impunity. Uh, the laws of war say that when dealing with the kind of military problem that Israel faces. You have to ask, you have to do a couple of tests. You have to ask, is an action necessary? Is an action proportional? Not proportional that one side must suffer the same casualties as the other, but proportional in the sense that the, um, the harm done is proportional to the benefit. Um, so obviously you do not blow up a whole apartment building in order to get one gunman. But if the atomic bomb is underneath the apartment building, then you do blow up the apartment building. Even if in both cases, the, the casualties are very lopsided, one side to the other. The proportionality is to the thing to be achieved, not to the two casualties. Um, uh, Israel is not doing something wrong by doing a better job protecting its civilians than Hamas does of protecting the people it rules. So when you see these disproportionate casualty counts, that reflects Hamas's determination to expose its subjects to risk. That's not on Israel, that's on them. But cutting off electricity and water, power, all of these things. I mean, this is the international community just criticized Russia for doing that to Ukraine. No, it didn't. The why is it different? Why, okay, so first thing. Uh, Russia, stopped, um, uh, Russia stopped electricity by, attack, by sending rockets to attack Ukrainian power facilities. These are things that Ukraine owned, that Ukraine built, and Russia blew them up with missiles. The, uh, uh, Gaza gets half its electricity from Israel as a gift for free doesn't pay for it. Um, and the other half of the electricity it generates from solar panels. Hamas could have, Hamas has lots of generators of its own. It has lots of diesel generators that it uses for military purposes. Um, it's run out of fuel because that's where it chose to put its resources. Hamas itself released a video that showed, this is their video, not anyone else's. It showed their um, uh, gunmen pulling water pipes out of the ground and converting them into rockets. That's their decision. And the idea that Israel has some obligation to Say, um, like step one, uh, 
you know, Hamas plan, step one, cross the border, murder people, rape people, um, behead children, abduct hostages. Step two, ask the other guys to give you food, water, and electricity. Like if, if the idea is it, not only you're not allowed to come after your hostages, but you, you, you are required to provide them with electricity for nothing. What kind of, that, what kind of, what kind of deal is that? I mean, it really is asking, uh, why not send them a check while you're at it and say, here's for the care and feeding of my relatives and a little bonus for yourself and enjoy your mansion in Qatar at my expense. Um, no, these, these are not, uh, what happens is that because, um, that, that because look, if the problem is Hamas, the world has a very dangerous problem. If the problem is Israel, the world has a simple problem. It's Israel, you can kick around. Israel is subject to pressure from the United States and the European Union. So I think a lot of this is people want the, to solve the easier problem. You know, there's a children's joke, how do you get down off an elephant? And the answer is you don't get down off an elephant, you get down off a duck, which is a pun, but also it's a lot easier to get off a duck than an elephant. So everyone wants to believe they have the easy problem and not the hard problem. Hamas does not represent the average Palestinian, though. And the Palestinian leader barely gets a look in in these negotiations. He's been sidelined by these the, the militant terrorists. Hezbollah look like they're now going to get involved. We have to look at the funding. Where's the money coming from? Well, Iran, as we know, is behind them. But Qatar also. Yeah. And Qatar is a country that communicates on a, on a civilized level. And yet behind the scenes, there is a lot of funding. And of course, Russia who is very much on the side of, of the uh, militants as well. Well, um, the Qatari leadership um, was, I think, deceived in, in important ways like everybody else. So for the past couple of years, um, and this operation probably was planned over two years, I'm guessing, maybe a single year, but certainly not less than a year, probably more like two. I'm just thinking about the drilling that you have to do to do this paragliding things. And, and of course, you can't train paragliders in... Gaza, it's flat. You have to, yeah. um, you, they, 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 you have to get people into Iran. Yeah, it was like something out of a James Bond film. Right. Seeing get them into Iran, do the training exercises, get them back. So that that's taken a yeah. while. Um, so the, the what the world believed, the United States believed, the Qataris believed, was that Hamas was focusing on um, building infrastructure in Gaza, building resources, um, stealing a lot of money, obviously. But you know that maybe that wasn't the worst thing in the world either. Um, and that the flow of funds from the Qataris uh, into Hamas was was buying the Qataris some influence, but also maybe buying some peace. And Qatar, as you say, has this important complex relationship with the United States as well. The very large American air base uh, is in Qatar. Qatar used to have a kind of quasi diplomatic relationship with Israel, not anymore, but it did. So and they're it's a playing, member of the Open Skies Agreement. So yeah, it's, they're playing it's a complex in and out of the U.S. all the time. They're they're playing a, a complex game. Um, and they didn't understand the people they were playing with any better than the rest of us did. Yeah. So we now have new insight. I mean, that because you would say, why did they do this? I mean, it's so crazy. I mean, that yes, they they inflicted pain and suffering on people they hate, but at such a terrible price to themselves. And we don't want to think about that. There are people in the world who say, you know what? I'm prepared to trade tens of thousands of my people for a few dozen of yours uh, because I don't care about my people and I know you do care about yours. And the suffering to you from what you lose will be greater to the su than the suffering to me from what I lose, even though I'm going to lose 100, 10 times, 100 times what you lose. Is this war going to be the war that ends the, the struggle and the, the fight over, over territory of the, of the, of the state? Uh, I, mean, is, is, I don't know. Is this I, that I, catalyst for that? Because nothing else seems to have worked. So one of the most moving experiences of my life was um, – I think this is, I'm not going to forget the exact date, but in the late 1990s, I was invited to take part in an annual, a, a war college exercise held at the French military school in Colmar in Alsace. And the attendees at the school were half French officers and half German officers. And everyone talked about war problems and then they had cocktails and they had a wonderful dinner. The French mercifully were providing the food. So it was really wonderful. Um, and I, um, I was, there, there are a handful of non-French, non-Germans there. I was one of them. I spoke spoke enough French, no German to get, to get along. I just thought, this is, I said to one of the German officers, I find this so unspeakably moving. I mean, when you think about all the suffering that was shed for this patch of ground in Alsace Lorraine, now here you are, you know, over cocktails and dinner, planning your joint defense against third parties. 
And he said, yes, I've, I've never understood that Alsace-Lorraine business in the first place. If, if you wanted a house here so badly, why didn't you just buy one? That <laughs> uh, was really <laughs> both crass and beautiful at the same time. And I am sure that the day will come. The day will come when there will be a common economic zone and hop on, hop off buses to uh, tour the holy sites of three religions. Um, and when people will say, what was that all about? And I, I hope it comes soon. I hope I'll live to see it. But in the meantime, but it's not here yet. And until it comes, um, you cannot, re and people are asking of these, you cannot reasonably ask the Israelis, allow yourselves to be murdered in this way because we have an ideological conception um, about the kind of risks that you should run. The the um, in the short term, Gaza has been reduced to rubble, and the um, Netanyahu gave the people of Gaza twenty four hours to evacuate yeah, not, before not the troops that, were going to hit the ground. Not right? clear that that twenty four hour number came from the Israelis rather than from the United Nations. That, okay. that the, the Israelis communicated a message to the United Nations, and the United Nations then issued a press release or a statement saying they had twenty four hours, and the Israelis then said, "No, we don't. We we have not given you a specific time limit." Right. So, so what, the UN said twenty four hours is not enough to evacuate right. a million plus people so from the an area may, that doesn't may, have infrastructure. Israeli may have changed its um, deadline. It's possible they didn't tell the truth, or it's all possible there was a misunderstanding, or it's possible the UN didn't t t uh, tell the truth. But um, the, the southern part of Gaza City, which is the more affluent part, is certainly rubble. rubble. The northern part of Gaza City, which is the poorer part, is substantially damaged, but but not rubble. And then there's a, a lot of Gaza to the south of Gaza City, where there are smaller cent centers of population, and those are much less badly damaged. Um, and the hope is that the people of Gaza can um, can move out of the way. Hamas doesn't want them to go because they are valuable. To, that, they're their insurance policy. Human um, shields, effectively. Yeah. I mean, in an ideal world, what would happen is there would be a checkpoint at the Egyptian border. There would be some kind of a, uh, Egyptian task force to check the papers of people to make sure that these were, in fact, civilians, and then some way for them to cross the border, get on a bus, and go to Cairo for the duration of the war. Um, but that's not happening. Um, and you cannot ask... Look, you, in the end, you cannot say that because Hamas is sacrificing its own people, Israel therefore must be defenseless. That can't be the line of argument. Israel has to get its hostages. It has to smash Hamas's war-making power. Um, and because Hamas has put the human shields in the way, there's going to be suffering. That's wars are, They shouldn't have started this thing. It's a terrible thing. People are going to suffer terribly. But since they started it, you can't say to the Israelis, well, they get, they get to keep every at regular intervals, crossing the border and, and massacring you, and you just have to hunger down and, and put the pillow over your head and take the blow. Uh, at a rally on Wednesday, Donald Trump said that Benjamin Netanyahu let us down just before the uh, killing of the Iranian general Qasem Soleimani in 2020. He also said Israeli leaders needed to step up their game. He referred to Hezbollah as very smart. Uh, I mean... This and this is now causing re Republicans to denounce him, and for the first time in many cases. What what's on Donald Trump's mind here, and whose side is he on? Well, the Qasem Soleimani killing, Qasem Soleimani being the head of the largest irregular force in the Iranian army, um, and one that had committed many terrorist acts uh, in Iraq against American soldiers um, and and against Jews and Americans worldwide, uh, is an example of how. Look, even Donald Trump is right sometimes. Um, so the United States has uh, apparently, I'm told, had opportunities to kill Qasem Soleimani before. And wise heads in American foreign policy always said, don't do that. Don't do that. It's just too dangerous. It'll incite a larger regional war. Uh, plus, you may need him as an interlocutor sometime. Don't do it. And Trump, who never listened to anybody, said, do it. And he did it. And a, a terrible human being got what he deserved. And none of the consequences that the smart people expected to happen did happen. Um, so in that case, um, Trump has a little bit of a right to complain. Uh, I mean, it's understandable because it was a, an almost unanimous view among the knowledgeable people that this would be a terrible mistake. And it but it did out, cause some destabilization, including yeah. the shooting down of an airliner with the loss of, of, of 240 lives. It, it, yes. Um, but that was an Iranian – that was an Iranian – crime, not an Iranian military. But it was still retaliation. Um, it, it, was a, it was a retaliatory act that took the lives of many of their own people. Actually, they're mostly Canadian nationals, I think. Um, 
but uh, they didn't have the strategic concept. The idea that, that Iran would go on a, a rampage of terrorism, um, that didn't happen. Um, and and uh, so you can see why Trump complains. Uh, I, by the way, I have to say that had you asked me 12 hours in advance about killing someone, I would have said, don't do it, because I would have listened to all the, all the experts tell me it's a bad idea. Uh, I would have, you know, I, I'm not an, any kind of expert, but I would have deferred to the expertise of the people who were. Um, that said, uh, Trump is very mad at Netanyahu, and um, you can expect that these images from Israel of giant billboards thanking President Biden for his support and this impassioned speech that President Biden gave about his personal connection to the state of Israel and the Jewish people, that, that's going to rub Trump the wrong way and provoke him to do some destructive things as he's prone to do. And, and Megyn Kelly said that the reason that Trump is angry with Bibi is because Bibi said that Trump lost the election and Biden won. Yeah, well, it's look, um, what are foreign heads of government supposed to do when the United States has an election? Um, you know, that Bibi doesn't say, he, he's not a Fox News guest. He's the, He was then the head of a government and uh, the head of the government has to follow American process. Biden did win and was certified and Trump's attempt to overthrow him failed. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but yes, Trump is is mad at him. Um, he's probably mad at a lot of people, and that's going to be a big problem uh, for the United States and the world in the year ahead. And and in the unlikely but dangerous possibility that Trump somehow stumbles back into the presidency, um, it's an example of what we have to fear. Okay, another quick pause, and then we're going to come back, and I want to talk about the race for House Speaker here on the weekend show. Being on top of your mental health game is so important. As you know, I'm a journalist. In addition to all the work we do here, it's so easy to fall into bad habits or routines because life gets in the way, especially with your diet. Frankly, I think most people can relate that everyday life gets in the way, making it challenging to find a healthy snack without all that sugar and junk. If you're busy and constantly on the go like me, you need to try Mosh. It's a protein bar made for your brain. With six delicious flavors, each Mosh bar includes 12 grams of protein and is made with ingredients that support brain health, like ashwagandha, lion's mane, collagen, and omega-3s. At 160 calories and only one gram of sugar, Mosh protein bars are the guilt-free snack your brain and body will crave. Your brain is your number one tool, which is why Mosh protein bars are mindfully formulated by some of the top neuroscientists and functional nutritionists. Mosh now has a line of new plant-powered protein bars in three delicious flavors for those who want all the protein and brain support from the original bar now made with plant-based ingredients. I have a Mosh bar every morning to kick off my day, and it's totally improved my performance. I love the taste, especially the peanut butter Mosh bar. It's delicious. Not to mention the packaging makes it super easy to take with me if I ever find myself hungry in between meetings. Don't settle for a mediocre snack when you can nourish your body and mind with the fuel it needs to succeed. So whether you're at the gym, on the go, or just living your best life, Mosh Protein Bars will keep your brain and body fit, fueled, and feeling good. Head to moshlife.com slash weekend to save 20% off plus free shipping on your first six-count trial pack. That's 20% off plus free shipping on your first six-count trial pack, which includes all six mouth-watering flavors. M-O-S-H-L-I-F-E dot com slash weekend. It's The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis, and uh, we're joined by David Frum from The Atlantic. Um, just before we go on to talking about the, the race for House Speaker, I did want to mention that Ukraine has all but disappeared from the headlines in the, in the last week since this attack on Israel. Um, how, how is this attack going to affect the not just the, the war effort there, but also the financial support? Because obviously money is now going to be redirected, isn't it? Well, uh, it, Ukraine hasn't disappeared from hearts and minds, I hope. Um, and indeed, the Russians took advantage of um, the temporary distraction of the television cameras to launch an especially barbaric rocket attack yeah. on cities in Ukraine um, on uh, Thursday of, of last week. Um, but what the Biden administration looks likely to do, and I am enormously heartened by this, is to put together an aid request for Ukraine Israel and Taiwan into one big bill um, and make the defense, understand the defense of democracy is collective. We call it collective security. 
Uh, Ukraine's needs and Israel's needs are not competitive. Um, Ukraine needs mass. Ukraine needs artillery shells. U- Ukraine needs fuel. Um, uh, U- Ukraine needs cash because they have, you know, they're paying pensions. At the, they're running a health service. Their economy has been shattered. Um, but they have to, you know, they have to keep, they have, they have to run a modern social insurance system without any kind of resources. They, they need those humanitarian aids. They have, they have people who have been displaced from their homes. Um, so they need money. They need mass. They need, uh, and they need sort of uh, previous generation weapons. Uh, they need aircraft like F-16s. Um, Israel has plenty of weapons. Um, it is, what Israel needs is super high edge technology. Um, so uh, the United States has much to find the hostages who are going to be, who are presumably somewhere deep underground. You need listening devices um, that um, the United States has more advanced versions of than the Israelis do. Um, you probably may, you may need the United States has sent a team of experts in listening technology along with the devices because they, there may just not be enough human beings to operate the listening system that you have to listen to to find the, the hostages. Um, there there are other kinds of satellite information and, and technological reconnaissance uh, that. Uh, um, and Israel will need, there have been a lot of homes destroyed. Israel will sooner or later need some assistance. A lot of that is already coming from diaspora Jewish communities. Tens of millions of dollars are on their way, but the needs are, the needs are not competitive uh, and they're they quite, they're quite congruent. And Ukraine has nobly uh, stood by Israel um, given that not most Israelis, but prime minister Netanyahu took a much more ambivalent, Approach to the conflict, uh, partly for reasons of state. Russia is Israel's neighbor because they occupy. They're such an important presence in Syria, so we had to be careful. But Ukraine has nobly stood by Israel, and I think a lot of um, people in Israel now realize they owe they owe um, a, de- a debt to Ukraine. So, uh, what I hope from all of this is, you know, I, the the United States economy is um, double what it was in. Um, the United States has created something like 50 million net new jobs uh, since the end of the Cold War. This is an, uh, the United States is an enormously rich country. It has a very it has a very inefficient healthcare system that consumes a lot more money than it should. It has a very inefficient tax system that fails to raise the money that it, that it should. But when the United States needs to do something, they, when people people say, "Well, this will cost 10 billion dollars," and the United States can't afford it, and they don't, they just take, take if you're if you've got the right kind of calculator, take out 10 billion and divide it by 20, divide it into 20 trillion. Um, and see whether the United States can afford it or not. Yeah. The United States can afford to defend its friends, um, and um, especially because these friends are defending the United States at the same time. The supreme American interest is a peaceful, orderly world where commerce is, uh, can travel, where human rights are respected, and uh, where Americans can be safe while spending about 2.8% of their annual income on national defense. The problem we have, though, is without a Speaker of the House, how is any of these bills going to get voted upon? Because, you know, the, the, the recess continues. The, the U.S. has been without a leader um, uh, for more than a week after, you know, Kevin McCarthy gets thrown out. Steve Scalise is in one minute and out the next minute. Now it's looking like Jim Jordan and Austin Scott of Georgia have declared bids. Um, conferences met again. I mean, without a speaker, the House is, paral- is paralyzed. It, it, it literally cannot support Ukraine or, yeah, or Israel. Or fund, or fund our own government and the, the, many, right. the many needs here at home. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But because you know, uh, the United States government on its present trajectory is scheduled to shut down on the 17th of November, not because right. we're, uh, we don't have the money, but because Congress hasn't voted it yet. Yeah. I'm going to say something that's going to sound like a crazy optimistic thing. I mean, optimistic among grief and pain and sorrow and horror, but optimistic as to the means with which we meet those things. Um, I think there's, there was a very large appetite in the Republican caucus for fooling around uh, before October 7th. There are, there are a number of people in the Republican world who love this stuff. They, they don't, they don't have opinions. They don't care about laws. Uh, they don't care about programs. There's not, they want to be on TV creating havoc and being seen to create havoc and they love it. Um, and their colleagues think these guys are doofuses and public menaces, but normally they're too frightened or world weary to deal with them. Because this aid package now must pass, uh, because uh, support for Israel is so genuinely popular in the Republican world, because a majority of the caucus does want to help Ukraine, uh, and three quarters of the House of Representatives does want to help Ukraine. And when these things are linked together, as the Biden administration will do, I think, um, there's going to be enormous pressure. And that is going to force the Republicans 
to come up with a responsible speaker choice, which doesn't look like Jim Jordan. He's not a responsible choice. Um, and by the way, not a competent choice because a speaker has to, especially with a, main, a majority as thin as the Republican, a speaker has to cajole and move people and bring them along. So um, what I am hoping for um, is that uh, the Republicans will find uh, in the backbenches somewhere a person who has some trust with his Democratic colleagues, who can carry uh, the great majority of the Republican caucus with him, and who will then do the deal with the Democrats that McCarthy should have done at the beginning of this, which is we've got a five-seat majority here. Um, eight to 10 of them are deeply irresponsible people. So I'm going to need to borrow a couple of dozen votes from you every once in a while to organize the House. Now, I'm not saying you have to vote for my bills or anything. Vote against my bills, of course. But every once in a while, I need to raise the debt ceiling uh, to fa- pass this continuing resolution to organize. I'm going to need a dozen of your, two dozen of your votes. There's something you must want from me. And that's the conversation that needs to happen. And Hakeem Jeffries has been signaling over here, pick me. Yes, I've, I've got a bunch of, again, organize it, not, his request or not, we want you to pass the Green New Deal. Uh, his, his, uh, his requests are all organizational about the kinds of ways that Congress or the House should vote, uh, ways that the minority gets to introduce bills even if they lose, um, you know, housekeeping bills. So there's a deal to be done here. And I'm hoping that this emergency will mobilize the 200 or so Republicans who came to Washington to do real work. But there is still that faction that, of the far right, well, isolate the them. Matt Gates, the Marjorie Taylor Greens. I, they're the ones who started all this chaos, and they are still holdouts, and their it, votes are necessary. Borrow two dozen votes from Hakeem Jeffries from time to time with uh, some kind of structure in place where they get, you know, they get to vote on their bills when they want to. Um, continue to disagree on substance, but agree on procedure. That That is not beyond... Um, negotiating ability of rational human beings. And 200 of the Republicans in the House are, are, I think, very rational human beings. But but critics are saying that this is an example of how the Republican Party would lead if they got back into office. It's total chaos that they can't find. They are find, in office. Well, that they can't find consensus. <laughs> we don't need to ask the concession, what would it be like if Republicans had a majority in the House of Representatives? Look, yeah. the, um, what we're seeing here actually is, is part of the price of the Republicans' campaign in 2020. Kevin McCarthy assume he was going to have 240 seats. And then he didn't have to listen to any of these weirdos. Um, he would have a big enough majority that he could tell Matt Gates to go date an intern. Um, uh, but because he had a five seat majority, he's in a, he was in a difficult position. And because he never dared or imagined or whatever the explanation is to do the kind of deal I'm talking about, of borrowing votes for procedure, um, he was stuck. And I'm hoping that the next person will under- learn from McCarthy's mistakes. I don't want to negotiate with Matt Gates all the time. I, I'd rather negotiate with Hakeem Jeffries, and his asks are, are um, doable. The criticism of Steve Scalise is that he has cancer, and therefore he's not a sure bet. I mean, how, how did you feel when you heard that? Well, um, it's a bad thing to say. I'm not sure it's a bad thing to think. Um, that is to say, uh, these are extremely demanding jobs, and you want to know that people are going to be able to do them. Um, and and we all wish Steve Scalise well. He he was he was a victim of a, a gun violence, and he had, um, was horribly badly wounded. He made a great recovery from that, and we all are grateful for that. But you want to know th- there are some physical elements to the job of politics, and so it's, it's not an unreasonable thing to ask. I mean, you don't say it out loud uh, where the microphones can hear, but in your private discussion to say, is this person up to the people ask that question about President Biden? It's a reasonable question. I just want to finally say that for me as a European, and I know you've spent a, quite a bit of time in, in the UK working in, in, in British politics or thereabouts, that, that the UK is a very small country, 65 odd million people, and we have a thing called a national conversation where the tabloid newspapers to kind of redirect the politics, and it, it's just a very small thing, and therefore change can happen quite quickly. As you saw, we lost a prime minister and gained another one in a matter of minutes recently. So, but in the U.S., you know, you're in Washington. The bubble is very much a, a bubble. And so much of what we've been discussing about borrowing votes and, you know, this person doing favors for that person. The, the sadness that I feel is that for the average voter and person on the, on the street who is having to live in the U.S. right now, it, it's, it's still pretty tough. And all of this this clown show that's going on in, in Washington really does not affect 
or is affecting them negatively and is yeah. not benefiting them on a day-to-day -day level? Well, I disagree with some of the criticism of Washington as being a bubble. Because um, if I lived outside Washington, if I were someone who is not so interested in politics, I, I would take the view, look, I'm, I'm here running my life, doing whatever I do, running my family, running my business, um, whatever I do. And I pay you to think about things so I don't have to. You know, so I want you guys over there like, the same way. Like, how much do I know about how an airplane works? So I, I want to know there's someone who's absolutely obsessed with how the airplane works before I step on the plane. And, and there's a community of airplane, airplane safety experts who are talking all the time. about How do they ensure the, the safety of my plane? And then that way I never have to think. about it. I just get on the plane and go on with my life. Well, politics should be a little bit like that. Um, you know, that, uh, you shouldn't have to worry that um, misanthropic people in Washington are going to default on the debt and bring the world financial system to an end. Um, you know, you can argue, but should there be more debt? Should there be less debt? But you want to know the debt's going to be paid by a country that amply has the resources to service, service its debt. Um, so I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with capital cities or Westminster being a bubble. That, that's, that's nature working the way it should. Um, what you want it to, to be is a, a bubble that operates in the spirit of, of service and that achieves positive results and where people get their opportunity at regular intervals to render their judgment as to whether they like um, one group or another group or a third group uh, to manage the affairs of state. Um, and uh, the United States is doing a less good job of that. Um, and that's, that, that's a real trouble. Um, I also think when you talked about the average person isn't doing well that well, the average person um, is doing a lot better uh, than they have in a long while. I mean, unemployment is, is down. Uh, inflation is, it has been brought under control. Um, uh, interest rates are high. It's difficult to buy, uh, to buy a house or to finance a house. That will come down too. Um, but given the, the COVID disaster that we've come through, um, given that, that we are facing this terrible war in, between Russia and Ukraine, which together produce a quarter of the world's exportable food supply, uh, given the threat to energy supplies in the Middle East from the war that Hamas has unleashed there, um, I, uh, given the waterfalls and rapids and chaos, this little, not so little, this boat is moving pretty smoothly. And even though the, the captain um, is not the most eloquent captain and maybe not as um, fast on his feet as he used to be, the captain is getting us home okay. Be very interesting to see how that plays out in November. Uh, next year, and I, I think I'm not one for predictions, but I think he'll you? be. I, I, I think um, modern statistical science began with an experiment done by Rald of, of Charles Darwin. He was at a county fair in Britain, and um, there was a contest where you paid a, a little bit of money, uh, you guessed the weight of a prize ox, you wrote your guess <laughs> on a piece of paper, and you put it in a jar. Right. Um, and then they fished the jar, and whichever guess was closest to accurate won the private prize ox. And what uh, this relative discovery, this is the discovery of um, probability and bell curves and statistics. What he found was that this group of people who were many of whom could not have read that there were some extreme outlier guesses, but the guesses converged ever more exactly on the accurate weight of the ox. And, um, and the, and the conclusion was that you put 200 people together and even if they, they individually can't read and even if they individually may have some foolish opinions, they get wiser and wiser as there are more and more of them. And you put 300 million people together and they're wiser than 200. So I'm, I'm going to rest my faith that, um, as Edmund Burke said, the individual is foolish, the species is wise. I, I would only, ca I agree, but I would only ca caveat that with, with if you're white and straight and Christian, then maybe these things might apply. But for poor black and brown people or for trans people right now, uh, or for the you know the LGBTQ plus community, with the amount of negative and hateful rhetoric that there is out there, along with the fact that the cost of living is skyrocketing and you know wages cannot keep up with that, means that life is actually very difficult. And and this kind of goes back to my point about a Westminster bubble or a Washington bubble, is that actually the the elite are the people running the media, and therefore they won't always mention these things. Catastrophizing is a kind of bubble. Too. And um, because w when you catastrophize, um, people don't want, one of the things I've discovered in making predictions, in politics, 
which I try to avoid doing, yeah. is there are enormous penalties for get, being optimistic and wrong, but there are zero penalties for being pessimistic. Because if you say, oh, the stock market is going to crash, the money's going to become worthless, the banks are all going to fail, and you turn out to be wrong, as the people who say those things always are, people think, well, at least you're realistic. At least you're not naive and full of illusions. Whereas if you, think the, if you say the opposite, then people think, oh, yeah, you always, you always say the money's not going to become worthless. I say, yeah, I always say the money's not going to become worthless. It's true. And that your fancy new money that you invented in, a, in your attic, that's not going to become worth anything for very long either. So um, I would say... Yeah, avoid complacency, but avoid catastrophizing. The United States is in every way a richer, stronger, better country uh, than it was 30 years ago. That doesn't mean it's, it was a richer, stronger, better country than it was 30 days ago. There are ups and downs. Um, COVID was pretty bad, and the learning losses that many children suffered because the schools were closed too long, um, those are all real things. And of course, it's, it's better to uh, not be poor than to be poor. And of course, um, certain groups in society start off with some advantages over other groups. Um, but the possibilities are enormous, and we don't do anybody a service when we deny them and, and when we inculcate helplessness. I mean, one of, the, one of the questions I think that I don't like the word woke because I don't know what it means, and I don't think anybody else does either, and it means so many different things. But there has been a change in the way we talk about our society since about 2014, and it may coincide with the spread of social media. Um, or the rise but, of Donald Trump, potentially. I think even, even, even you can chart it in various ways, starting in about 2014, maybe going back to 2011, where, where at least there are some indicators that people did become genuinely more unhappy and our public way of talking about the country became more negative. And, and the question is, anyone who's ever been encountered depression on the individual level knows that the first step to over, you may, maybe you need some pharmaceutical help, but you also need... Um, therapist to help you to teach your brain to think non-catastrophic thoughts, to, to engage, to be optimistic. And um, when, it, when it, the messages that the depressed brain sends to the depressed person are deceits to doom that person. They don't make the person better. Um, you know, uh, they, they make them worse. Everyone is judging you. Everyone is scoffing at you. No one takes you seriously. Um, that is not good information from the depressed brain to the depressed that's That's poisonous information, and you have to learn how, not, how to overcome it. Well, when we do that collectively, it's just as bad. Um, because even if it's true that many people have disadvantages, they do better if they believe they can overcome those disadvantages than if they're told they can't. Um, what, what they need is hope, not um, doom. And they need the hope, especially because the hope is much more true than the opposite. Okay. David Frum, thank you very thank much you. for joining us. A pleasure. Bye-bye. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash 5-Minute News. Also, the 5-Minute News daily podcast. It drops every morning. You can hear me tell you what's going on around the world while you make your morning coffee. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on the 5-Minute News weekend show with Midas Touch. Midas Touch.